Well, where we are, main road, Moss Side. Um, I was born and brought up about half a mile in that direction, I suppose, near Alec Park, uh, Russell Street, uh, which half of it's knocked down now. There's half of it there, but they've knocked the other half down. And I used to go to school just over there, Claremont Road, nursery, infants and juniors. So did my brother and my sister. Um, band was started by a friend of mine called Paul Gilbertson. I was at school with uh, Gibber. And uh, I was 15, he was 15, and he got a nicked guitar. And uh, he bought a nicked guitar for someone for a tenner. When I met Jimmy and Paul and Gavin, they were 16-year-old lads who had stolen most of their equipment, um, couldn't really play. I decided that we should start a band, and I'd never touched an instrument in my life before. I'd never had any inclination to. Um, so he said, get a bass guitar, get a bass guitar. All bands needed bass guitar, he said. Uh, and he found a mate that I'd, um, was selling a, a bass guitar and an amplifier for 50 quid. And two weeks after getting my bass guitar, I'd never touched a guitar before in my life, we played our first concert, which was Eccles' British Legion. And um, we were on before this band called Controlled Anger, and they were kind of fairly competent musicians, but we were absolutely appalling. <laughs> I volunteered to sing, and uh, again, in the very broadest of terms, uh, I sang the first show, uh, and we got through about a song and a half, and then the DJ pulled the plug and demanded that we stopped. <laughs> Paul and Jimmy were young hoodlums who used to support Man City, and they would go to away games and find out where the away pubs were, and they'd run through the pub fighting and try and get out the other door. I was dancing in the Solon Bar, Manchester University. I was, I'd only had a pint or so, but m my girlfriend had left me. I was really upset and I was dancing very extremely. There's two ways you get into the cellar bar. You either get students to sign you in, or you used to sneak in, because there's various ways we knew of kind of like windows. And uh, we had no money, of course, so we used to just go around nicking people's drinks. <laughs> just like, going, do -do 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 -do, and just bang it down and like sod off again. And, um, Gavin, who was the drummer in the band at this time, nicked Tim's drink. These guys apparently had seen me dancing and thought, let's ask him to dance for our band. And then I came to sit down and they were nicking my drink. Tim kind of like, you know, sort of like stood up to him, but of course there was three of us there, so Tim kind of quickly backed down. And we started talking, because there were three of them, and I decided a, a fight was probably not the best of manoeuvres on my part. Because he was at university, we thought, oh, he's good, clever, got brains, university, bright lad, obviously. Uh, we'll get him to help write some lyrics. We went down rehearsing the next day and we kind of forgot all about this. We were just like, grunging away, as we usually do. And, uh, and Tim turned up and uh, he was like, oh, yeah, that weird bloke, he's drink me next, yeah. When I'd arrived at the band, they did have some songs together, but um, the lyrics were terrible, um, embarrassing and they wanted me to sing them and that was when I decided I had to write lyrics. I mean, they naively thought because I was at university I'd be able to write lyrics, just they assumed that. And it put me in this position where I didn't say no, so I, I just had to go and do it. We had a gig coming up in a couple of weeks. We asked Tim to come down and just do some, we had a singer at the time, just come down and do some backing vocals and whatnot. And he said, yeah, right, I'll have a go, like. And uh, that was his first gig, I remember him, just, he was terrified. And they brought me in as this kind of, you know, as like this middle-class um, ponce in, in terms of their fans. They had about 40 fans who were hardcore. And the first few gigs, they hated me. And they just tried to intimidate the fuck out of me. He was absolutely terrified. He was just stood there doing backing vocals about three tunes and shaking a tambourine and dancing around. <laughs> oh, yeah. They had songs like, um, I have a way with girls, me being so good looking. I have a fantasy, I want to be raped by a woman. And I, I didn't really want to sing that one in public. So um, I kind of started writing lyrics through desperation. James didn't talk very much in the early days. He just didn't talk. Um, we'd go to a rehearsal room, we wouldn't discuss the music, we wouldn't discuss what we were doing. We just used to get there and play. 
Well, most James songs have always come from improvisation, which is just jamming in a room. To understand how, how we write songs, you have to go back to the beginning. We used to stand in a scout hut that we'd hired for four hours and just make a racket for hours. And we were very uncommunicative. So the thing used to go on and on and on. Somebody starts doing something and everybody's listening and they pick up on it. Uh, it's usually very simple, it has to be simple, because if it's any it's complicated, nobody knows what the hell's going on, it just sounds chaotic. Over, uh, after about a year, I think I started recording them, sessions. Um, I think the others had done this a bit, but I, I kind of, I started doing this more after about one or two years. And I'd record the session and listen back to it. And I'd find the four minutes of this cacophony that I thought, oh, this is good. And I'd bring it into the next rehearsal and play it back, and we'd try and recreate it and start to build songs. You know, it would ramble on for about half an hour and 45 minutes and it would get recorded on it, one of those little crappy tape machines. It'll go through, you know, big, huge celebratory bits where you can go, oh, that's the chorus, and then mad, mad introverted drop-downs, and then weird kind of experimental bits, and all the bits where people stop and start fiddling about with things, or having a brew, or got the bog or anything. And you listen back to these huge jams that's just like mad, mad, mad landscapes, you know? Most of it was rubbish, but within that 30 minutes, you'd find three minutes of coherence where something great happened, it just came together and then it, it wandered off. And you kind of go, right, how the hell do we turn this into a song? And you have to go back and you, you get the bits and go, that bit's good, that bit's good. You can, just, you can find the bits that work and then you distill that and work on them and kind of truncate everything and make a, you know, a, a pop song out of it. It was just this organic thing that grew on its, grew on its own. Rehearsal for them really is the place where they generate music, actually, because most most of their music comes out of improvisation. It's a very magical process. They were recording the track Gold Mother and they uh, asked me to bring my trumpet down to the studio. It was all set up, the full band were there and we were just jamming. It was amazing. It was just like, I'm used to doing trumpet sessions with bands where they go, they sit you down, you have to do a part and it's overdubbed. And this was just a jam and that's, that set the scene, that's what James are about. We were rehearsing, you know, four or five days a week, five hours a day, uh, just making a racket with each other. And that, we learnt to improvise and make songs up instantly, every day. And that was an incredible skill to learn. When James parted company with their old drummer, Tim kept phoning me up. He wanted me to come and audition. I didn't want to do an audition because I don't like getting knocked back. So I thought, why set yourself up just to get knocked back? But he just kept, he was so persistent. He just like, keep on phoning me up, even to the point where Jimmy told me later, the rest of the band would be saying, look, he's not interested, give up. But I think it had something to do with the fact that he goes to see a clairvoyant who said there's a Dave from Wales. So he just, he just wouldn't let it go. In the end, he said, look, we just want to, we just want to, he changed it from being an audition into saying, just come and play with us. Um, we'll, we'll pay for a van, bring your drum kit up, and we'll just have a play. And I was like, that sounds better. I hired a van, came up to this place, Beehive Mills, and uh, we had a play not an audition. Can you ever in a show? It seemed to go all right. A funny bunch, though. They had a little code which they told me about afterwards to say, so they could t say to each other during the, the jamming, the session or whatever, whether they thought the guy playing the drums was any good. And I, they told me this afterwards, and it was, um, are you going to go and see the throwing muses tonight? And if it was yes, then it's like, yeah, he's all right. And if it's like, no, nah, I don't think I'll bother, it's like, mm, it's, it's not happening, like, let's just uh, make our excuses and go. They actually said to me that out of the 20 or 30 drummers that they had auditioned, I was the only one who made them feel like I was auditioning them. <laughs> Which wasn't my intention to do, but that's how it came about, and it, and it seemed to work. So um, they, they went to see the throwing muses that night. 
It must have been on the next floor down. I mean, it wasn't like it is now. It's all been, you know, done up and it was just a, an empty old factory. And we just have to share the rehearsal room with a heavy metal band. Not at the same time. <laughs> that would have been a bit difficult, but yeah. And we're always getting broken into and finding all our keyboards at Johnny Roadhouse in Oxford Road. Changed a bit since you well, it has. It's a lot smarter now. <laughs> yeah, we used to rehearse in this half, and the heavy metal band were down that end. Excellent. <laughs> yeah. That's nah, all changed since I was a lad. <laughs> He's a lovely man, Larry. He really, really is. He's kind of like everybody's uncle. Oh, good Lord. <laughs> I was, I was on the dole, and uh, I used to do things on the side to earn some money. And um, one of them was give guitar lessons. And I put a little advert in a local newsagent's window, and Jimmy, and uh, and Paul, the original guitar player, they were two of the first people to answer the advert. So I started to sort of, I was like their guitar teacher. And we both booked in for a lesson one week and we didn't turn up and then we're like about three weeks later Paul goes, oh, I feel really bad, we'll have to go around to see him. So I remember we bought a bag full of booze like, and, and went round to see him. And, and they came in and we, we had a really good night and then we became friends and they left this tape with me, a little demo tape that they'd done. And uh, by then they were called James and there was four songs on it, one of which was uh, If Things Were Perfect and the other one was Him From A Village. So I put it on after they'd gone, you know, and I listened to it, and I just thought, you know, I just saw it immediately. It was, uh, I'd heard, in the area that I was in, I'd heard lots of, like, student bands and young people's bands, you know, and their demos. And they were all of the same kind of monotonous type. And there was this little jewel that just shone out of this crappy little demo tape. I started to take gigs for them, then I did sound for them. Larry would play with us every now and again, um, as and when we wanted him to, as and when we could find a rehearsal space and, and drag him down, he'd just come down and have a go. It just kind of grew like that, until one day they just said, well, do you want to be in it? You know, you're like, <laughs> why not? Over the years, just, he kind of grew into being in the band, I suppose, and was with us for a long, long, long while. From my first gig, which would have been... <laughs> I can't even remember the name of the nightclub, it's not there anymore, near the town hall, right through to uh, the last GMAX gig. The making of that, of Whiplash, coincided with Larry, it came out of Larry leaving, in fact, and threw us all into quite a, you know, confused state as to how we were going to write on, you know, the next batch of material. He's got a furniture company now, designs and makes furniture. Um, kind of mad stuff out of mess. And incidentally, this uh, thing he made here to sit on this evening is available in all good Conran stores. Looks a bit uncomfortable, are you sure you don't need some cushions? We were making music that was seen as very left field in those days. It's hard to believe now. We were never played on Radio 1 for the first eight years of James. Ever. Daytime. Ever. John Peel played us in the evenings. That was it. The industry wouldn't have it. The industry was just like, you know, wouldn't, wouldn't have us. Wouldn't have us at all. I mean, it took years to get on Radio 1. Years. We made Gold Mother record with Jeff Travers' Rough Trade and he released Sit Down. And it was quite different and it was very soft. It was very kind of a dreamy version of it, and it was released and did nothing, and everybody told us we were shit. They, they spent nothing on advertising because they said, you aren't going to sell anything. Jeff said, you'll only ever sell 20,000 records. I went to see him personally. 
And I said, well, will you let us buy the record back off you? Because we want to take it to someone who has a, a bigger vision of what we are capable of. And he generously allowed us to take the record back from him. And we took it to Mercury. We all knew that it was a massive anthem. And it was just, you know, so we, we re-recorded it with a completely, a much bolder approach to it. And suddenly, we were it. Overnight. Very strange. Well, sit down, I mean, sit down with it. It was brilliant, you know, I mean, five or six weeks at number two. I've been a fuzz in strip line. <laughs> it turned me, folk music, but it's cool. And then, um, one man clapping was top as well. Excellent. But sit down is shy. Yeah, sit down. We don't really want to play sit down. Shy. I'm bad enough for that now. I mean, it just students gets bad on the radio, doesn't it? I mean, no one wants to hear no, it anymore. Students. No. I I'm fairly early stuff. Students stop, sit but... down, it's crap. Yeah, sit down. Oh, so yeah, they all sit down and everything. And it's gone past that now, you know what I mean? Moved away from Manchester and came back here for a night. Ended up in this place. And uh, they used to have like, well, they probably still do, I suppose. They had like singers' nights, players' nights, where people would get up and just do stuff. And uh, that wasn't my intention to do that at all. Uh, um, but there was a band playing, and Larry who, uh, was here and went up to one of his mates who was playing in this band on the stage, a guy called Clive, who played harmonica in this band that was up there and said, uh, that bloke over there has got a violin. Tell him to get up and, and do something. I had my violin with me because I refused to leave it, and I used to take it everywhere with me because it was the only thing worth anything that I owned, and uh, I wasn't going to leave it in the car around here. So, uh, <laughs> and uh, I played a, a one-note violin solo, which I've kind of been doing ever since, really. And uh, that was it, Larry said. Hmm. I'd come for an audition tomorrow, so I said. It'll have to be at nine o'clock in the morning because I'm going away again. He was like, yeah, okay, so he rang around the rest of the, uh, Tim and Jim. So I've met this weird bloke who says he'll come for an audition, but it has to be at nine o'clock in the morning. They were like, oh, fuck him. And Larry says, no, 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 I think we should do it. We, do it. So we all got there bleary eyed and uh, did another one note violin solo. And that kind of said, yeah, we're looking for people to work with. <laughs> A few days later, I received a tape through the post of a load of demos that they were working on and some of their tunes. And I just thought, this was the maddest, kind of almost music. It wasn't, some of it wasn't really, you know, definable as, well, it certainly wasn't pop music. They were like noisy, scratchy things that had elements of rhythm and melody in them. And I thought, how the hell am I ever gonna fit into this, like it just isn't going to happen. And uh, about three days after that, uh, we were on tour. Paul Dunican and Charlie McCoy. Hello. You know, one of my favourites. <laughs> Excuse me. But don't ever knock the great Val Dunican in my presence, please. Sorry. <laughs> you know I'm a big fan. Well, you, yeah. Nick, most of his best ideas. System configuration. Mm. I did the woolly, woolly cardigans, the calm, gentle Irish manner, the rocking chair. <laughs> so, uh, you may be wondering who this interloper is here. This is, uh, uh, nine years of our producer, friend, and major inspiration to us. This is Brian Eno. Well, we've been trying to work with Brian Eno for, for donkey's years. I think every album that we did, um, he was top of our want list for producers. I mean, when you look at all your favourite artists, you know, whoever it is, and Bowie, and Talking Heads, and U2, like, Eno's produced their best album, you know, and it was like, well, he wants to produce us, he wants to produce our best album. They sent me a tape. And the first song on the tape was the song Sometimes, which I immediately thought was one of the great pop songs of all time, actually. I, I absolutely loved it. And we just thought, you know, our demo would be in the kind of three bin bags of demos that turned up every day at Eno's office that he never got to even hear about, you know. Um, 
And you know, I don't know why he did, but he took the demo away with him on holiday and he was uh, listening to it on the beach on his Walkman and, and completely fell in love with the demos and, and rang Tim up when he got back. He said, hello, this is Brian Eno. You know, we were expecting like, these things normally go through managers and agents, through our record company, through our management company. You never get to speak to anybody, you know. And there was Brian Eno on the phone, you know, which was ridiculous, saying that, yes, I'd love to do the album. The songs were wonderful. Um, so that was it, really. I mean, Eno, Eno came along and <clears throat> we... Um, worked with us on the tapes that we generated and we, and we recorded, re-recorded other things and we worked on and came up with new songs in the studio. Crash is a track that had not existed before, if I had a stare hadn't existed. And there's a few things there that, um, that were generated in the studio which have much more the kind of stamp of Eno and the band on them. Wawa, um, the album with Brian Eno, was a totally improvised record because Brian heard us improvising and he said, don't touch them, don't do them, don't develop those into songs, let's release some of those. I love that stuff. Non-repetitive structures, um, song structures that were, each of them, like a little story on their own instead of like a cycle, which most, most songs kind of go back round and repeat things. Um, and we like more and more the idea of songs that started in one place and ended in another. Brian gave us a confidence in our jamming. He was the first person to come along and say, well, these mad jams you do are actually equally as valid as the songs that come later in the process. I think it just um, it pushed individuals in the band to find new ways of working together. If you've got seven people in a room, all of whom are egomaniacs. You know, it's, it needs a very strong hand to, to uh, guide everybody through that process. There were 210 possible combinations of people in, in that band, not including me, and since I, I nearly always played with them on every song, um, or sang or something like that, if you included me and it went up to, you know, 256 or something like that. So, so part of the issue was trying to use the the possibilities of that variety. And sometimes I would just say, OK, we need something different to happen in this part of the song. Why don't we pick a random three people and say they are the only players on that part? We're having a problem with the song. If the song you haven't got a problem with, it, it leaves you alone. You know, he's one of these producers that feels the need to, you know, stamp his authority across everything just to justify his, his, the money he's getting paid. If something sounds great, he'll leave it alone. You know, that sounds wonderful, actually. I think uh, that's probably a take, in fact. But if you've got a problem, that's when Eno comes into his own. He's, he's problem solving. Brian was always good at trying to, uh, if, a, if a song was stuck in a certain area, it would, like, it would always come in at weird tangents to try and break it and push it somewhere else. Ridiculous ideas. And what he'd do, he'd have these cards, and he'd, write, he'd sit there and he'd just he'd write a word on it. And then he'd go up, and you, other people wouldn't see it, but he'd show different people in the band the card, and have descriptions like wobble on it. So you have to musically try and wobble. Or he'd like change key, and he'd show this to one person, so one person had to suddenly change key. So we'll call these sections Denmark and Sweden, right? So I'll have a D on a bit of paper, and I'll have an S on a bit of paper. How more simple can this get, boys? OK, just go over that again. So we're going to Denmark to record the album. No, you tit. Scratching his head and thinking. And then he'd just say, stop. And he'd kind of hold it and someone would say, stop. So he'd kind of stop playing, you know. And <laughs> Waving these bits of paper. And we're all going, what's a G? Just mad. Just trying to break up the... the, 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 the this, I mean, if a song had got locked, you know, just trying to break it up, finding a way to smash it into something else. It was always a lot of fun. We always really enjoyed working like that. I mean, and making it sound like I came in and bossed them around it. And it wasn't like that at all. Thump, thump, thump. Wankers, how more, much more simple can I make this for you? <laughs> I thought he'd come in and he'd be like, like some sort of strange scientist and everything would be like computer central and all that. And he hates them, he hates computers. He's actually very rock and roll. I suppose if I had to describe them, uh, or if I had to describe what attracts me to them, is it's the combination of completely eccentric, unclassifiable, very emotional, and with a, ki a kind of sparkling energy. For me, it's very, very exciting. I mean, I I've enjoyed working with them more than anyone else, I would say. 
Just like in the early years of James's existence, I mean, we, the industry couldn't find a place for us, and the only thing we could do was to play live, you know, just to keep going. When we get up on stage, something seems to happen. It's something that I don't think we've ever managed to get in the studio. So, you know, playing live is the best thing that we do, and people that watch us live know that. Live, so live. absolutely so live. brilliant, yeah. I don't know what it is, and I've... I don't think I want to know, or even... I'm not going to go and try and search and find out. It just happens. And, you know, that's it. We used to improvise on stage, usually one song a night, but then there'd be two or three songs where there'd be complete areas which were left open for whatever happened, and they could go any way. You know, the stage for us is a... I think... is a, is a very safe place. You know, it's like... We, we love playing in it, and it's... Tim gets openly very nervous before we play a show. Before gigs, I get terrified. Um, it's hard to explain what happens, but basically, I think in the day, your adrenaline just starts to rise, and you almost go into altered states of consciousness through the day. And, and you know, it can be really nerve-wracking, because you, you get into some very strange altered states. The rest of us, probably there's different levels of nervousness or excitement, you know, about it. And it's like, it's like the biggest shot in the arm that you could possibly imagine. There's a certain type of bloody-mindedness also that we, we go on stage with. We like, it, it feels a bit like home to us. It's our place. Um, and that gives you a certain amount of confidence in what you're going to do. You know, even songs that we don't actually know how to play, you know, we, you know, we'll sound check them and get a, a half assed version together in the sound check and then throw it in without any rehearsal, without anything, throw it in and see what happens. That's the master list. It's the short list for the tour. I know, 45 of them. Is it? Yeah. That's some damn fine list. 200 songs we've recorded. We've added nothing no. today, yeah. 200 songs we've recorded. Amazing. Oh. We played a song the other night called I Defeat that we've only ever played once before, other than the time when we recorded it. And, uh, like, we're... Jim's got his little bit of paper with his, with his chord sequences written out, and I'm kind of, like, glancing at it, going, oh, thank God he brought his notes along, because I'm fucked here. I've got no idea what, what I'm doing. And Tim said to me in the sound, well, why don't you play violin on it? I played guitar on the recording on it. He said, why don't you play violin on it? I'd be really nice. I'm like, oh, no. I don't, I don't know what to do. Right? Everybody said, God, I loved it when you played that song. It sounded beautiful. And we're like, huh, got away with that one. How do you do this? And just people vote for well, I, I little know, dots by I, each. I know, is it, each person votes for three. Is there anything else? The longer the least votes get stitched. Well, well, why don't we write a set and then see what will go best in the, in the set that we've got? Well, it's the only song that could follow Sit Down, if we wanted to follow Sit Down. I don't think it's going to bother thinking you don't about think it. Know. Okay. How about, I think um, Space is the first encore sound. Like a, a, yeah. That's a great idea. Sounds a really nice idea. How about if we change tomorrow and Yen around so him familiarly goes into John yeah, Yen? Yeah, yeah, yeah. A jam would have, you know, some vague thing. They say, oh, let's try and play it tonight on stage. What? What, in front of an audience? Yeah, yeah just, just, just have a go, see what happens. And uh, I love that spirit. Once I, once I clicked into it, it's like, yeah, yeah, this is, this is good, you know. I think it's sort of, yeah, collective improvising is another you know a feature that this band does very well uh, certainly on a good night you know take songs that you've played you know a hundred times into a new area for me it's like when you play live the audience are giving you energy to play better to go to take the take the gig higher and then you you play your songs and send that back out to the audience and then they send it back to you with the audience you get a sense of no separation, which is actually, crudely enough, why I run into the audience often. Because I'm actually in a gig, I sometimes get cut off. I've got these earpieces in, you're in your own little world, and sometimes I'm feeling really cut off from the audience. So kind of instituted in this band, in James, is, is an idea that potential failure is a very, very good thing to have. And that'll give you a huge spike energy. Audiences love mistakes. They love you for it. You know, if you fuck up, they're just like, yeah. No, no, you stop and you start again. And the audience loves it. You know, it's, it's, it's like your, your mistakes happen. A lot of bands should try it, actually. <laughs> Dave's a fucker for never ending the songs in a place that we've either rehearsed or done in the sound check. 
and you know and you can sense it like you get to the point where a song might finish and you just know there's another gear to go uh, but sometimes it'll just stop and we'll go like <laughs> and in those moments sometimes somebody will actually just start playing again because like no we haven't quite got there yet and it'll kick off again and then maybe go into something else and that takes a different type of communication yeah we might be looking at each other but you're really really having to listen. Go to the end section where you know you do those lovely finger things where it keeps spiraling. We developed this credo um, in James that we should improvise wherever we went, that, that if you made up things and stuck your neck on the line, an audience would understand that, would appreciate it. Even if you completely messed up, um, getting away with it all messed up has become our kind of catchphrase, really. Oh, for God's sake, this is so unprofessional. Fucking hell, man. I'd ask for your money back if I were you. James has been a band that's always kind of evolved and changed characters, and that's almost like one of its qualities in a sense. Um, uh, you know, sure, Tim and, and Jim have become mainstays from, from the original days, but I think the band has evolved through its personnel as, as well. <laughs> I've known Saul since we were uh, teenagers in Hull. In fact, we had a band together briefly at one point, which was absolutely terrible. <laughs> uh, where we only ever did one gig, I think. We used to go busking in Hull uh, until the police threatened to lock us up for obstructing a public highway. Um, so we found other places to go near Hull, which are a bit posher and a lot more lucrative. Could I have a bit less Adrian, please? And we stayed in touch over the years, and, um, you know, I went to see James play a few times after he joined them. Larry left, it was like, well, shit, what are we going to do? We need, we need to find a guitar player, you know. Uh, somebody really knows what they're doing, you know. And then I thought, oh, Adrian. So I started going along to the studio when they were recording uh, Whiplash. And uh, they put me in front of, in front of uh, this recording setup they had set, a, set up in one of the uh, cottages at the studio, a real world studio, uh, and played me this track which had this thumping uh, drum rhythm track. Uh, and this vocal somewhere lined somewhere off in the distance and absolutely nothing nothing else, no no bass line, no chords or anything, and they sort of went, well, play something. <laughs> yeah, and, and made him made him play guitar with a paintbrush. I just thought it was bizarre. <laughs> just, so what are the chords? Well no, right, I mean just a drum machine and a vocal, but uh it worked, you know, I like the fact that they work in, you know, I mean, it might be a bit unorthodox, but then that is, you know, I think that's very James, isn't it? You're pretty cool, aren't you? Mm. That's some kind of weird initiation ceremony. <laughs> Larry was kind of leaving and the band was working on Whiplash back in the UK. Brian Eno had approached him about the idea of, of having backing vocals being made a little bit more prominent because he was adding a lot of, I think Eno was putting in a lot of backing vocals as well and had done even when making Laid. And uh, I imagine Larry and even Andy in the earlier days were singing a lot so uh, it opened up a space for another live vocalist. The way it all kind of came together uh, in true James fashion, it just kind of, you know, I don't know, happened. It's like um, everything just managed to follow some crazy serendipitous direction and... Uh, still a mystery. Still a mystery, yeah, the kind of James <laughs> we are, you know. mystery, you know, just part of it. And, uh, Four or five years later. That's right. I mean, essentially, uh, it's you know, it, uh, you know, I think a great, a great band to play with. You know. The 
think it was V98 or 99 or something at Chelmsford where I got hit over the head by a full <laughs> bottle of Sprite. <laughs> Uh, some bastard. <laughs> it was <laughs> lost. It was lost. And it was one of those. It was one of those situations where because Adrian was, um, you know, he was in the middle of playing something. And he, he had his head, head down, down and he was, you know. he was really, uh, he was really getting into it. And and a few of us, Jimmy and I particularly, watched this missile being thrown through. And he had no idea. And the two of us looked at each other in the and he and it slowly just bounced off the top of his head. And you went flying back and then had that stunned look like, who would do such a thing? Where did it come from? And then just proceeded to just get on with the guitar, just, finishing the guitar. Well, I, yeah, I just picked up my guitar again and carried on. Oh, but, but it was, it didn't, you know, sorry, I didn't want to laugh. Neither did you. No, but we had but, to. Well, it, I've, it never, just, I've, never, I've never been able to drink Sprite. You don't want to laugh, but you kind of have to because the poor guy just didn't expect it. It was plastic, but it was it full. Was <laughs> the point is, it was full, so it was quite heavy, you know. I mean, cut, cut, the top, cut the top of my head off. Did it? Yeah. Did it cut it open? Yeah, well, not suffering. really badly. All oh, right. I feel bad now. It's <laughs> laughing. Yeah, James and record companies. Um, yeah, not always a happy relationship, strangely enough. Um, I think, again, probably just because we're awkward sods. We really, really are. I mean, we've always demanded, really, things our way and always interfered in everything, every aspect of, of doing what we do, even when we don't know what we're talking about. Or particularly when we don't know what we're talking about, to be honest with you. Cantankerous, grumpy, difficult fuckers. I mean, from the early days of Factory, I mean, the first singles on Factory, and we thought Factory were just the big bad enemies, you know? We thought they were terrible people, just come to, you know, like, to take our firstborn, you know? And they were, we thought they were the devil incarnate, and they were wonderful people, Factory, looking back on them, they were lovely people. And we stayed friends with them, you know? Um, and we didn't realise, actually, they were the good guys. And we left Factory and then signed to Sire, um, who weren't the good guys at all, they were absolutely terrible. Um, I went through a hellish period, you know, and we'd built up a lot of momentum at that point. You know, front cover of the enemy, and we'd done the Smiths tour, and we got a single of the week, the first two singles, and Peel sessions, and then bang, we disappeared for four years. And we weren't being played on radio, and nobody wanted to know about us. We were getting some critical, you know, acclaim from the enemy and people like that. But equally, those daft bastards were going and doing front cover front covers for the enemy saying that they didn't actually want their faces shown. You know, it's like, ugh, the, the game wasn't being played. They sent Kevin Cummings up to do this photo shoot and he's like one of their top-notch photographers. And uh, we kind of were in there and we refused to have our faces in the photograph. So we had to take the picture of backs of people's heads and make the rest of it all really blurry so you couldn't see anybody. Um, and I think the reason we told the enemy was that we didn't want, and I'm going to get this right, we didn't want people to um, see our image before they had a chance to hear the music because we thought it might colour what they thought. But if I'm not mistaken, actually, I think the real reason is because we were all signing on still. So we decided to do things ourselves, and that's when we did the live album, One Man Clapping. And we started working with Rough Trade, um, with Jeff Travis, um, and released a couple of singles with Rough Trade. And then he paid for the recording of Gold Mother, and we, the intention was for us to kind of do a distribution deal with him to put it out. In the meantime, we were still playing shows, and we were getting wooed by some of the big, the big companies. We obviously, saw you know, ka-ching, there's potential here, um, and that's when Mercury stepped in, and they bought the album from Rough Trade. They paid for you know all the costs that they'd incurred to that point, uh, and released it as the first album on Mercury. Uh, and off we went, really. Then that's when we had sit down was a hit, and you know, top of the pops, and blah blah blah. <laughs> If Larry hadn't left and I hadn't gone off to make the Angelo record, the next James album would have come out straight after Laid in America, where we'd sold nearly a million, I think, and we would have broken America, because the head of the record company loved us. When I brought my record with Angelo to him, he said, we're going to make a small 20-minute movie. It's, you know, I commit half a million dollars to this. Fantastic promotion. I mean, it was, like, incredible. And two weeks later, he got the sack. Unfortunately, the new head who came in, he hated us, and he wouldn't even meet us, wouldn't give us the time of day, never saw James live. And so when the James, when the Angela, minor Angela record came out, that was the end of that one. They released one single, but always the big single was, was a ballad called Fall In Love With Me, and they, they dropped it, and they uh, deleted the album. And then the James record came out, couldn't be bothered. And that's, that's how the record company, that's how, not, th this, that record company was the best we've had. And so put that in context. <laughs> but, you know, that's the nature of being in the band. It's about so many different aspects. And 
interfacing with big business corporations is the, the hard thing. People think when they've got a record deal that that's it, they've made it. And that's when it begins. And that's when your troubles begin. You, you know, you, that's why you have to have a great manager um, who can actually speak your language, the artist's language, self-important, you know, totally idealistic, just wanting to make great music and move people, and the language of the corporations, which is we have to sell so many thousands of units or you're out. And you have to have a manager who can walk that tightrope. And we do. He's, you know, he's second to none. Um, I can't, you know, that's all there is to say about it, really. I don't really know why I'm leaving. It was just really waking up round about the summer and going, I think it's time to go. It wasn't a surprise. Uh, Tim said he was going to leave. Um, went into shock slightly afterwards, but it wasn't a surprise, it didn't really surprise me. Seeing that this is actually a really good time to go in, that we're in a really positive frame of mind. I nearly left four years ago. I wrote a song, I Know What I'm Here For, hanging on through late December. And I figured I was going to leave at the end of that, a December tour. No one ever knows that. That's what that lyric meant. And we'd have left acrimoniously. It would have been an implosion, bitter. I didn't want a bitter taste in my mouth when I thought about James, you know? Like I'd put all this into it and I just thought, you know, I don't want to go when I'm in a store and like, you know, there's a James tune on. I don't want to like, you know, walk away with a like, pan on, you know, and be miserable all day thinking about everything. You know, I didn't want that. I didn't want to walk away from this feeling bitter. Um, so I just thought, you've got to stick it out. You've got to make it work. However it ends, you've got to come away thinking, yeah. And we got through that hard time with some very strong conversations and strong airing of truths. And in the last two years, it's been fantastic again in James. And it just feels like end on a high. It was a bit of a kind of bunny in the headlight syndrome after that. You know, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? Um, Jamie Cato, from, uh, who used to be in Faithless, he rang me up and said, you won't understand how much of your energy was wrapped up in James until you finished. And then you'll find you get masses of energy back. I immediately went out and wrote a, a screenplay that I'd been wanting to write for five years, but had never had the courage to write all the time. And suddenly I was free to write it, and I wrote it in five weeks. I think they should go for a young, sexy 21-year-old and who is photogenic as hell, and they'll have huge success because that is where the industry has gone. Um, the fact is, they're brilliant musicians, brilliant musicians, every single one of them, and I, they have a right to do whatever they want to do. I'm the one who's leaving. You're joking, are you? No. No, he's leaving. Over the who's game that, to eh? Are you kidding? Is he eating out? Oh, oh my God! Oh, no. no, it won't be no, same. Yeah, you know, yeah. We'll see what happens. You know, it's like you know, there's a lot. You know, there's always a lot of people involved. Um, you know, like so tonight. You know, there's, there's you know, seven people in the band. So, you know, so we'll see what happens. For me, it just pulls back all the bloody-minded kind of arrogance and determination of the early years to kind of push this through to the other side. I feel there's another chapter of James after this. I feel excited by it. It feels like our back's to the wall now. We either, what do we do? We either crumble or we fight. And we got here through fighting. <laughs>